Matthew chapter 7, looking at verses 13 through 20. If you need a Bible to follow along, we'll bring you one. And we did order some larger print ones for the Bibles here. One of the ushers pointed it out to me, and he's like, have you ever seen these? And I was like, no. <laughs> We're continuing in the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God, how to live as a child of God, how to believe as one who has a father in heaven. And we close the last section with Jesus telling us how to find the kingdom of God. Remember, he said, ask, seek, and knock, and it'll open. The door will be opened. It seems so simplistic and yet so deep in nature. Ask, as this asking leads to this seeking in life, and it leads to knocking on the door of God's heart. And Jesus, the Son of God, told us he will open. As we ask and seek, he will open. And now he declares to his disciples, even today, starting in verse 13, then enter. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. This is one of the scriptures that would always intrigue me. Because of its simple message. And yet the depth of its nature. As this door, this gate opens, of course we must enter this open gate. We must leave the place where we are in our spirituality and enter through this door, this gate, which is Jesus. As Jesus told his disciples from John's Gospel, chapter 10, that he was the door. He was the gate of the sheepfold. As Jesus described this, this gate as narrow or small. The old King James translates it straight. And the Greek word implies there are immovable <clears throat> obstacles on each side that make that gate narrow. And from verse 14, <clears throat> we see this narrow gate is difficult to pass through, and few find it. Is this why Jesus exhorted his disciples to seek and to ask, to knock, and to continue to knock because of this inner gate <clears throat> or this hidden gate, this door, as some Scholars suggest a door within a door. As Jesus also describes this broad, open way that leads to destruction on this path of life. He says, a path many are on. And of course, the context of <clears throat> that destruction is eternal separation from the Creator, from Almighty God. But... Why would God allow the way to eternal life to be narrow and difficult? And it's then I think we realize, <clears throat> excuse me, that God didn't make it that way. It was the sin of man that made it a narrow, difficult path. And there are few who find it because Jesus said it is narrow and difficult. One must really want the kingdom of God in order to find it, which I think makes sense. Only those who desire this need for God's kingdom will find it, making it a reality to those who do. And for those who don't, 
are apparently ones that didn't want it in the first place. It's interesting. As God knows all things and yet leaves it up to each individual to seek what they really want in life. <clears throat> all the while with the Holy Spirit in the world convicting people of their unbelief, of their sin, and of the coming judgment that we see from John's Gospel, chapter 16. <clears throat> so Jesus tells his disciples the way to God's kingdom will be through a narrow, unpopular, uncomfortable, tight place that few choose in life. And as we choose this path with Jesus, many will say to us, why are you doing that? Follow Jesus thing. Isn't it hard and restrictive? That can't be any fun. And we should tell them what Jesus said. The way to eternal life is narrow. Even if they say we are narrow-minded or not open to reasonable things like, well, if I'm a good person, then I will go to heaven kind of thing. We hear that a lot, don't we? I think that's when we must ask them if they have ever stolen or cheated or lied or not been honest in life, which most people say, well, of course, no one's perfect. <clears throat> and we must ask, then why should God allow an imperfect, sinful person, a lying, cheating thief into heaven? And generally, people roll their eyes and say something else that is completely irrelevant to that issue. But we must hold our ground in the truth of God that all have sinned and fallen short of that perfection that God requires. And maybe that's the difficult place Jesus mentions. The way is difficult. It's not easy. It's not broad, but narrow. Only one way, by coming to the truth in God. The truth that we have all failed in righteousness and will be judged by a righteous, just creator. Unless we accept through faith God's plan for salvation for that judgment, entering by the narrow, straight gate that leads to everlasting life. It's not man's way, but God's way. The Apostle Peter wrote to the church that there was no other way that man could be saved because only the blood of Jesus, God the Son, could make atonement for the sin of all mankind, which can only be applied if a person acknowledges before God that they are a sinner and believe Jesus died on the cross to make them right with God. I know I'm preaching to the, the choir, but it's good for us to remember these essentials of the gospel of Jesus because you're going to go into this world and you're going to hear a lot of false things about God. And the more we hear the truth about God, the more we can respond in a very natural way with the truth of the gospel. Jesus verified all of these things. Before he went to the cross, remember he prayed, Father, if there be any other way, let this pass from me. Speaking of going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. And as Jesus went to the cross, he verified to us that there was no other way. And his resurrection from the dead verified that it was a work of God. It was God ordained. It was God approved. It was God sustained. As Jesus now exists 
at the right hand of the Father forever in heaven to continue to save every sinner that will acknowledge the truth about their own sinful condition and come to faith in Jesus Christ. Only one way. As Jesus said from the gospel in John 14, 6, that he was the way. He was the truth and the life and that no one could come to the Father except by him through faith in Jesus who has made us right in the sight of God through the work of the cross. Have you accepted that narrow way? Have you accepted what God has said in his Bible as the absolute truth? It's a narrow way, and there's only one way. We must be reminded of these things because in the world today and even in the church, they say, oh, no, there's another way. We see several examples of that even in our modern culture. It seems another reason <clears throat> this narrow way is so difficult is because there are so many other ways that lead to destruction, Jesus said. This broad path that many are on in life, and this is where Jesus gives a serious warning to his disciples, starting in verse 15. He declares... Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? You know, the thistles, the spiny thistle weeds. Verse 17, even so, every good tree that bears good fruit, every good tree bears good fruit, fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Jesus gives this stern warning to his disciples. Beware, be on your guard. Watch out for false prophets with a false message will come to you. As, of course, we know a prophet is one that is supposed to speak for God. But there are many false prophets, many false messages out there in this world today that don't come from God at all. Sometimes they call come from a secular humanistic view of God that we see all around us. Their source is the evil one who desires to deceive the nations with a false message. A message that implies that God loves us no matter what and would never send a person to hell. And even the hell the Bible speaks of is not a literal hell, but simply a metaphor of not really being where God wants us to be. I've heard that message in this world, and I hear it frequently. Jesus said, beware. This is so interesting, because it's true. God is love, and God loves all, and God does not send people to hell, but make no mistake, hell or eternal separation from God is a literal literal place that God prepared for the devil or and all who would follow or agree with the devil's message. With the truth being, people choose to be eternally separated from God by rejecting God's love that God dis demonstrated on the cross through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So God doesn't, in a sense, send people to hell. They have to choose to be there by 
rejecting the very love of God that they say they believe in. God's provision to save them from hell or eternal judgment. How ironic that the very message they twist in their perception to mean something completely the opposite. That's why Jesus said, beware, be on your guard, watch out. There are so many false messages and false prophets today as I began to work on this study. I had page after page after page from the news headlines all the way through the, the study of the early church. They were all a false message about God with some of the most clear examples that we see today in the religious world coming uh, primarily from the LDS or the Mormon church that came from a false prophet named Joseph Smith in the 1800s. How do we know he was a false prophet? Because his message did not line up with what God had already said in his word. God's word he has protected from the beginning. He's kept his word for over 3,500 years. There's also the Jehovah's Witnesses group that also twist what God has said into a false message about who Jesus is. Their, their main body is called the Watchtower Society, and they're a false prophet because they deny the deity of Christ. So do the, the uh, Mormon church. They deny that Jesus is God. The Mormons say, well, he's a God, but not God. It's, you can always tell if they're a false prophet by what they say about Jesus. John taught the church from 1 John that if those spirits won't declare that Jesus is God, they're a false prophet. I don't know why these guys didn't read their Bibles. The thing is, is they did read them, just like you did. And they believed that God had allowed his word to be corrupted. That, that because of what they saw in the church, they thought that God's word was corrupted. The, full, the church is full of people like us. Pretty messed up. But God's word doesn't change, right? So that's how you can tell a false prophet. Their message will not line up with God's word. We see so many of these groups. I like the Christian science movement. Have you heard of them? They're not Christian, nor are they of science. There are so many more today within the church. They tell someone like me that I am narrow-minded and bigoted because I won't verify or accept certain lifestyles as biblical. And I pick my Bible up and I say, should I read this to you? It's very clear what God said about those issues. And of course, God loves these people. He loves every sinner. But God does not verify sin because sin separates people from God. Come back to the truth. Come back to the way. Come back to to the life. There are many false prophets in the church today. And again, what these groups say about Jesus is usually a dead giveaway, that they come from a false message or false prophet. Their message can even sound good, but if it does not line up with God's word in the Bible, it's a false prophet. They will argue with you all day that their message does line up with the Bible, but have essentially changed the meaning of biblical truth to fit their message. Beware. Be careful. And they look like Christians on the outside, but are not. They deny the truth of the Bible, often claiming the authorized versions of the Bible were corrupted. Watch out. It's easy to verify whether we have accurate copies of the scripture or not. But especially these two main groups I mentioned, their message leads people into a works or 
performance-based relationship with God that either leads to hypocrisy, knowing they are falling short but can't admit it, or they reject their faith altogether because they cannot perform the standard of what that false doctrine teaches. And it's all inspired by the evil one. He knows we are sinful and could never be righteous in our performance of righteousness. That's why he brings these groups to the forefront in deception and they believe that they're Christians, but they are not. <clears throat> the apostles all warned the early church of these things. They took heed to what Jesus had taught. In his sermon on the amount, the, the apostle Paul writing to Timothy from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, and you can turn there if you'd like. <clears throat> he gives a real relevant passage to what we would see throughout the church history. He tells Timothy, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That means to be cauterized, their past feeling in their own consciousness. And they will lay all kinds of <clears throat> rules on people like forbidding to marry and commanding them to abstain from, from certain foods that God has created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, he says, and nothing should be refused if it's received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Don't be deceived by these groups that come in with their special dietary laws, with their special laws about what day you should worship the Lord in. They're false prophets. They're leading people away from the simple truth of the gospel. Uh, this scripture from 1 Timothy 4 has such an eerie resemblance to doctrine we see in the modern Catholic Church today, putting uh, all these rules and regulations, having their pastors not marry is what he says here, and abstaining from certain foods, you know, fish on Friday deal. And I'm like, didn't these guys read their Bibles? That's the first thing that comes to my mind when I see these types of things. They put their focus on a man or a priest <coughs> who is fallible. They bring the priesthood of man back into the forefront when the Bible clearly tells us Jesus is our high priest. Hebrews chapter 4. That there isn't an intermediary that man can replace. It's only Jesus. The issue Paul points to is to those who depart from the faith or the sole belief in the work of the cross to make us right with God. Instead of these man-made regulations that you might be able to follow and you use that for your righteousness before God. What does it cause? Paul says it would bring hypocrisy. It would lead to hypocrisy, which means to violate one's own personal conscience in an in inner reality. Once you begin to do that to yourself, you're in a dangerous place. As they would follow these unbiblical rules to be right with God. I wonder sometimes, do we do that? Well, I go to church on Sunday, even on Wednesday, and, and I make offerings to God. And when I hear people say that, I go, I think your focus is on what you're doing instead of what he did. Or if you're challenged, you know, um, in ministry or anything, well, I do this and I do that. Listen to how you respond inwardly to challenges as God tries to stretch your life. Listen to what you're saying to yourself. And if your focus is on what you're doing 
instead of what he's done, you're on a bad path. You're now dictating and telling yourself what you're going to do. Remember, we, we are not capable of leading and guiding our own lives. That's why he came to be our shepherd. We don't want that hypocrisy because Paul is saying it's going to lead us away from faith. Following rules, following our own set of standards is not faith. Leading to a pretending or hypocrisy in man that Paul says leads to destruction in the spiritual sense. The apostles Peter and John, <clears throat> along with Jude, who was the half-brother of our Lord, all detailed <clears throat> issues concerning false prophets or teachers, including their motives, their influences, and their final judgment. The early church was plagued by false teachers who were false prophets. The only security the church has ever had was believing that God had spoken to man and that God had protected and preserved what God had said to man through the authorized versions of Scripture, which we call the Bible. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, it's so easy to verify that we have an accurate Bible by comparing our scriptures with ancient manuscripts in the world's largest libraries. You can view them online, which will, will match our verified versions at over 99.7% in most cases. Although the wording can vary in various versions through translators, the message remains the same. And, and I realized this years ago as I will look at several different versions of the same scripture because they came from different sets of scholars who may th see things in a different way. It helps me to find a center clarity because these are all good scholars. I'm not. I just have a Bible and I have the Holy Spirit. And we know that God will show us the truth. So don't let anyone ever convince you that God wasn't powerful enough to protect his word. If God's word wasn't protected, how could God judge sinners? It all makes perfect sense that we have his word and we will be held accountable for it. So it's not that difficult to identify false teachers as long as we read and study our Bibles and allow the Holy Spirit to confirm the truth of God's Word in our hearts. It's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which leads us to a position of repentance. And I know for Pastor Isaac and I, we, we go through just repentance attitudes almost every day, seeing ungodly attitudes. God, I need to repent of that. Seeing, um, you know, wicked attitudes. I need to repent of that. So we have an active evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and you should have that as well. You have a Bible. You have the genuine Holy Spirit. Man, every day we should be in this consciousness of God and saying, man, God, I want to repent of that attitude. That's not biblical. It's not the path you've called me on. I either want a real Christianity or nothing. God loves those kinds of people. Those are the kinds of people that he's looking for. As Jesus said, he, he longs for those who worship in spirit and in truth. He doesn't like the churchy people. He likes people that really want a, a genuine relationship with him, and he will not disappoint. But Jesus says there's another way to identify false prophets or teachers. He says, by their fruit, in verse 16. Their fruit means how they live, the way they live, what they live for. And if they attain what they want as a teacher in the church through consuming the 
resources of the people of God, then they're a false prophet. They're, they're a wolf in sheep's clothing. They are consuming sheep to survive. Oftentimes, they live a lavish lifestyle, all the while manipulating the people of God to support them because, of course, they are the highly anointed of God. Don't ever believe that stuff. When I was a new Christian, the, the denomination I was in, they had a tendency to set their pastors up above everyone else as highly anointed. Oh, that was anointed. Oh, glory. And then as, as my life developed and began to, to understand these things, and as God called me to be a pastor, I realized that was a bunch of hogwash. I think pastors are even more sinful than anyone else. That's why God makes us pastors, to keep us close to him. <clears throat> the core of their message I found over time would be focused on getting people to support their ministry financially. They will present many angles and many ways that you can support those things. It was often linked to what became uh, called the prosperity doctrine, which essentially says if you sow a seed into this, this banging ministry here, this powerful ministry, then God will bless you. The whole premise of that is ungodly. I am now giving to get. That's about as ungodly as it gets. You, you've got to really beware and pray in these things. That if you're not giving to God because you're just so thankful of what God has done in your life and that you can be a part of a work of God. That he would take our measly few shekels and, and, and use them together to support, support international ministries and people that are really hurting. That excites me. And local ministries that change people's lives. Man, together... We can do a lot of good things financially because God lets us. He doesn't need our money. I think we give God a lot of headaches because he lets us give. He would do a much better job without us. He would look much better without us. But he allows us that opportunity to be a part of what he does. Oftentimes you will see many of these false prophets on national TV networks they, to, to get this message out to the masses. Millions of people giving, all based on hype and deception. Although not all uh, Bible teachers on TV are bad, you will know them by their fruits. I remember one guy had a, like a Learjet or something and was asking for people to support that ministry. And I was just kept thinking it showed a picture of him getting on that jet to fly to Uganda. And I'm like, ah. you know, it just hit me in the wrong place. I have to fly coach. <laughs> you will know them by their fruits, their lavish lifestyles, and at times through their sin, because they are led by the lusts of the flesh. They promise an abundant financial life to all who will support their message, manipulating the sheep by challenging their faith. And that's the part that makes me angry. Because if you really had faith, you would give. And you would give to this, can't you see how good it is? And they manipulate people emotionally, the sheep. Those are the folks that Jesus was talking about. But then I realize, man, I am just as carnal or fleshly in my heart. But God, through his grace, has kept me from that place because of his love for me. And it's not that God doesn't love the false prophets, the false teachers, but God knows he can't stop them. They will follow the life of the flesh every time and lead his sheep astray teaching and causing the sheep of Jesus to live for the here and now and to live for themselves instead of living for Jesus, to live for the temporary instead of the eternal. And that's their message. Again, I am no better. Possibly the only difference is 
maybe a healthy fear or respect of God, which I don't think is preached much in this day and age. But what is preached much today in the church is this false message. I hear it a lot that God just wants you to be happy. God wants you to make yourself happy. Even to the point of doing what we think is right over what we know the Word of God says. As a pastor, I see that more frequently than you can imagine. There are many false prophets with false messages in the world today, even in the church. Jesus said, beware, watch out, check everything they say with the word of God, especially if they're asking you for money. Especially. Think about what we're doing in life. I think this is sometimes propagated through teaching or declaring just some of what God has said, but not all. The Apostle Paul told us he did not hold back in teaching the whole counsel of God's Word, not just the easy to accept parts, but the meat of God's Word, the truth of God's Word that describes the very time we live in today so that we're not deceived about a false message or deceived by a false message about Christianity, especially the part where Jesus declares we need to die to self in order to follow him. And that's not to be saved. It's because we believe we are saved. And if we believe we are saved, why don't we want to follow Jesus? Because the way is narrow, and it's difficult. And it's difficult to die to self. I would say almost impossible unless you're in a church that's teaching the truth and the leadership examples that in the way they live. That they're the examples of denying self. Look at their lives. What do they do in their time off? What, what are their lives about? This is a hard one because until we want to submit our lives to him, we are going to be ruled by self. Or that old nature. And if we think, well, gosh, can't I just enjoy my life a little bit? Does Jesus have to be the, at the center of everything I do? I can tell you, I have found in over 30 years of following Jesus that if he's not in the center of what I am doing, then I'm never deeply or truly satisfied with what I try to do in life. It's what I've found. But if Jesus is at the center of what I live for, then he actually takes what deeply satisfies me and uses it for his purpose and glory. That's amazing. Can Jesus really do that? Well, that's what the writers of the New Testament describe. That's what the testimony of the pillars of the faith throughout the church movement tell us. Yes, it's a narrow, difficult way. And I think that verifies to me that it's from God. Authenticating our faith experience through that difficult place. And if you read First Peter Chapter 1 through 4, that's exactly what Peter talked about. So it lines up with the Word of God. What God tells us, a narrow, difficult, difficult way that will show us our faith is genuine. Evidently, that's necessary. But don't forget this, my loved ones. Don't forget the wonder and the awe we experience as Jesus reveals himself to us in this deeper way than we've ever known. He will lead you to the Father. But it's going to be in a difficult place. A place that the world as a whole would reject as fanatical and irrational 
even labeled as mentally and socially unbalanced. And then I remember they said those things about Jesus. Has he lost his mind? His own family must have thought he was off his rocker. And then Jesus stood before Pilate and said, I am not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. And if it was, my disciples would fight for me. But I go to my Father. And as Jesus ascended to the Father, he left his commission for his disciples. Go, make disciples of those you encounter in this life, teaching them of all that I have taught you. But unless we are living that message... It has no strength. That's a path we must be on personally. This is the Sermon on the Mount. It's what Jesus taught his disciples. Even to us, if we want to follow him in this life, in this way, in this truth. I think the key truth of Jesus is the fact that he's alive. And if you can get past that, I think it opens the door. This is what changed the lives of those first disciples. They knew he rose from the dead. They knew he was alive. And then it was all verified through that interaction with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that is still just as active today as it ever was in the lives of those that will ask, those that will seek and those that will knock on the door of his heart. So is Jesus active in our lives today? Or do we just know about Jesus and and think he's all right with us? Or is Jesus our Lord and our Savior? Is he still teaching us through the Sermon on the Mount? And when we come to places in the the Bible where we know we're not there? Do we pretend? Or do we tell him, Jesus, I want to be there, but I'm not. What is our relationship like with him? Because he's just as live today as he ever was. We're going to dim the lights and prepare to close the service this morning. If the Uh, Music ministers would come and you'd stand with me today. As we think about all of these things and the reality of Jesus, we don't want to be led into hypocrisy. And you can stand with me this morning. We don't want to be led into that hypocrisy because it'll war against your faith. It'll take you away from faith. So we just get alone with him and say, God, I'm not where I want to be. And he's so thankful when we come. If you've never realized that you're sinful in your nature and could never work your way into heaven, and you want to believe today that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and, and let his blood cleanse you of sin today, you can do that right now, even in the privacy of your own mind. You can tell him, Jesus, I want to believe in you. I may not even know how, but I want to. And if we see the hypocrisy of of this, it's our own lives, we can tell him, Lord, I hate that, that hypocrisy that I deal with. It violates my own conscience before God. And he will cleanse you and heal you. And the more we admit to him those places where we're not just straight up with him, the more sensitive we become and we will overcome those places because he's alive. He's with us. He always welcomes us as we knock. The door opens. It doesn't slam and shut in our face. It opens as we seek his kingdom. If you need prayer today and you're in a place of confusion in your life thinking, man, I just don't see clearly what Jesus wants in my life. 
We have elders and pastors that will counsel you, tell you what God has said. And that's what we need, right? It's not to condemn us. It's to, to fortify us. That's why God calls pastors and leaders in the church to shepherd the body of Christ, to tend the flock of God, to oversee them and to help them. So we'll be here for you after the service if you need prayer today. Let's just spend a moment bringing our hearts to Him in this place of reality. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that You are my fortress. You are my portion. You are my is open, that you're receiving us right now as we just get real with you and say, man, I'm not where I want to be in Christ, but I'm so thankful I'm not where I used to be. I'm so thankful that it's real to me. It's changing me day by day as I receive the Sermon on the Mount given to the disciples of Jesus 2,000 years ago and just as powerful today. Thank you for this time in your word, Father. Thank you that it, it goes right to the soul, that we never have to pretend with you or with each other. Who wants that hypocrisy stuff? We can be so real because we walk in love. Thank you for it today. Just overflow us with your spirit. Draw us back here to pray tonight. Sit at your feet and, and just cry out to God because the door, will open. May the Lord richly bless you as you go out today in God's grace and His love, and just let His power overflow your life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Give Him praise this morning.